The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, the British competitor for the Sherman and T-34. Tactics and strategy, naval recon aircraft. And Metal Beasts, the American supersonic bomber. What does an American attack aircraft need? Well, a good engine, capable of leaving your laughs behind the sound barrier. A hefty load of bombs, making the belly heavy with grapes of wrath. And a scary name, preferably one that has to do with a thunderstorm. Mix these three ingredients together, and you get the F-105 Thunder Chief, a multi-role fighter bomber. Its propulsion is provided by a turbojet engine with an afterburner. The central part of the fuselage houses self-sealing fuel tanks. The nose cone hides a radar. And right behind it, we see a 20mm autocannon with a good ammo pool of no less than 1,000 rounds. The suspended armament choices include bombs of various calibers, rockets, air-to-air and air-to-surface missiles. Despite being predisposed to ground attacks, the F-105 shows a good performance in air battles as well. Its high climb rate allows you to get above most opponents in order to seize the initiative, while its speed being close to that of top fighters makes boom and zoom a very viable attack tactic. Speed isn't everything, of course, but this aircraft also has an ammo pool that lasts a full 10 seconds of continuous fire. A great result even for a jet fighter. There's only one flaw for this cannon. It's offset to the left to make way for the radar. On the other hand though, have you ever seen a centered Vulcan? To make air combat even easier, you can take four Sidewinder Modification E missiles. As for maneuverability, well, you won't have any aiming issues, and you don't really need more. You see, when the F-105 loses speed, it becomes easy prey. Don't be confused with its streamlined shape. It's actually a ginormous plane for its class. Back when it was created, it was the biggest single-seat, single-engine fighter in the world. You can judge its size pretty well when the aircraft is loaded with bombs or missiles. And speaking of which, your best bet against enemy anti-air in mixed battles is a set of four bullpup missiles. Just look at those tiny little buzzers under the wings of this monster. Let's take it up a notch. Some time ago, we talked about the F-3H Demon and mentioned some extra-large 3,000-pound bombs. This plane can carry them too, even three at once. You know, they don't look so big anymore. Anyway, the Thunder Chief has an excellent set of bombs against tanks that allow numerous drops. And there's even a set with guided missiles to boot. Which means the F-105 becomes a full-fledged fighter after it drops its load, helping your allies avoid being bombed themselves. Which World War II tanks became the most mass-produced and therefore iconic? Well, we can definitely recall the American Shermans, the Soviet T-34s, and the German Panzer IV. They're all medium tanks with 75 and 76 mm caliber guns, a good armor and mobility, true iron fists of their armies. Of course, they acquired deeply modernized versions later, like the T-3486, or even completely redesigned successors like the Panther tanks. Still, the idea of tanks keeping their versatility up stayed relevant for years. And that's unsurprising considering tanks were capable of accomplishing pretty much uh, any task thrown at them. But where's anything similar from other countries? France did have some work done on medium tanks to replace the obsolete, clumsy Char B-1, but they'd never been able to finish it before the invasion. 
How about Britain now? Why hadn't a leader of tank building got a versatile medium tank? <laughs> Let's see. The year was 1940. The newest Crusader production was getting full traction. Yeah, it was subpar compared to its main competitor, the Panzer III. But they had no choice at the time. The better tank would have needed an amazing engine and a suitable gun. But the British had none at that moment. The Crusader had to be fitted with the unreliable Liberty engine, one developed as early as during the First World War. It goes without saying that it was nowhere near contemporary requirements. The armament situation was similar. No other options available aside from the two-pounder. The military must have known how bad it was. So they commissioned a new cruiser tank even before the Crusader hit mass production. Something with sturdy armor and a powerful gun, even if it meant reduced mobility. What they got was a machine with a new spacious turret and excellent front armor, the Cavalier. In order to solve the firepower issue, the engineers developed a version of the decent six-pounder gun to install into tanks. And finally, specialists from Rolls-Royce and Leyland built the Meteor by derating the Merlin aircraft engine. Sounds like all the problems were solved, uh, but wait. There was one little detail left. A more powerful engine generally requires a new transmission. So factories had to start building the Cavaliers with the old Liberty engines at first, while the engineers continued the work on refitting it for the Meteor. That version would be called the Cromwell. We hope you're still with us because a deficit of new engines led to the Cromwells being fitted with another engine. And which one would that be? Right, the old Liberty. And that's how another modification was made, that time called the Centaur. In 1942, the prototype saw some testing. The results were far from perfect, but when are they flawless anyway? The engines would break down, the crew placement was uncomfortable, and aiming the gun required more than 40 kilograms of force. On top of that, before the engineers finished fixing all of this, the army realized they didn't like the six-pounder much. What they really needed was a universal 75 millimeter gun. So one thing led to another, and the Cromwells only saw mass action by 1944, which <laughs> was too late. The tank became old. The Comet was the one to catch up with the rapidly developing competitors and had even a stronger gun and improved armor, only it arrived when the war was almost over. And that, dear friends, is another example of when the best is the enemy of the good enough. We covered the air and the tanks today, so it's time we talked about the Navy. The Winged Lions update introduced a new feature for some larger vessels, launching reconnaissance planes with catapults. Let's start with learning the controls first. Once the launch becomes available, it takes a little time after the beginning of the battle. Choose the catapult. The default key for it is U. Now the catapult follows your camera, much like torpedo launchers do. Once the indicator changes color from red to blue, you're ready for takeoff. Press U one more time, and off you go. You now have full control of the aircraft while your vessel continues along its course, even firing automatically according to the chosen fire mode. If the situation requires your attention, you get a message, like when there's a fire, or critical damage or shallow waters ahead. In that case, press U again to regain control of the ship while your aircraft flies in auto mode. How do you use this aircraft in battle? It's up to your imagination, of course, but we'd like to cover the most probable scenarios. The first and the simplest usage is reconnaissance. Climbing as little as a couple of hundred meters gives you a good view of your surroundings, including both the amazing scenery and the enemy movement. 
The latter won't be able to hide behind an island or take you by surprise. Moreover, the engine might be useful for correcting your fire in combat. It's way easier to judge how far away the rounds went, and the faster you get your aim right, the higher your chances of winning a duel. Another use is detecting torpedoes. They're easy to spot from above, which leaves more time to evade them. And don't forget that the aircraft has some weaponry too. Cannons and small bombs can't hurt a huge vessel, of course, but a torpedo carrier or a small boat are pretty vulnerable. Moreover, float planes have one major advantage. They can land on the water surface and capture areas, which you might find useful early in the battle before the enemy can get to it and stop you. Or later, when you're short on points and you need to stop a base capture urgently. On top of that, some areas found among islands are unavailable to big ships. Now, however, you can send a courier of sorts. There's one more unique thing for recon aircraft brought by the new mechanic. And that thing is the smokescreen. Employed by the combination of Alt plus G by default, you can set it mid-air at altitudes up to 50 meters, and the length depends on the speed of the plane. If you speed up enough, you can cover around 2 kilometers with smoke. And that's a great way to limit your enemy's view, get closer to them, or cross an open area safely. Alternatively, it's useful for covering your own plane while you're taking a point to prevent the most dangerous enemy from aiming their weaponry. And finally, when you're probably wondering, uh, what happens if my ship is destroyed while I'm flying elsewhere? <laughs> well, you'll still have control of your plane for some time. 45 seconds in arcade mode and 60 seconds in realistic. After that, your flight will be over. Tell us what use you invented for this new mechanic. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you asked us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Tofu King. What's the difference between the STB-1 and Type 74C? Aye, Tofu King, there's little difference. The commander and the gunner of the Type 74 can use the night vision device, and its ammo pool has heat FS rounds. Saturn asks, is there any jet in the world that is also a hydroplane? And if not, why not? Hi Saturn. Yes, although they're pretty rare. For instance, there's the British Sanders Row SRA-1, which performed its maiden flight long ago in 1947. Or the Russian B-200 that's still in service. Another question comes from Smonky. How do single-engine planes deal with counter-rotation torque to the aircraft? Hi there, Smonky. The rotation torque has almost no effect on controlling the plane mid-air. Well, maybe it's faster to make a barrel roll in the direction of propeller rotation. During takeoff, you might want to gradually increase thrust and adjust the plane's course with the rudder just a little. Andre Havel writes, Challenge! Top tier without stabilizer, thermal, laser rangefinder, and anti-ADGM. Hello, Andre. That's a fairly unusual idea. Thank you. We can't promise to show it in the next episode, but we're certainly doing that in the future. And the last comment for today was written by Agridly111. When will you add the Japanese Type 10 MBT to the game? Hi there. It's already there with a new update. Tell us if you like it. We're going to discuss it in detail in the Metal Beasts soon. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4pm GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. And don't forget to leave a like, never confuse a catapult with the obviously superior trebuchet, share your thoughts and comments, 
and see you next week. Hopefully, COVID will not slow me down, which I got earlier this week. Ah, well, I'm still alive.